Hello, everyone. Welcome to the No Line podcast. I'm Philip Beer. I'm your host. And today's guest is Christopher Justice. He's the CEO of Pavilion Payments. Chris, welcome. Hey, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And it's great to watch what Pavilion Payments is doing in regard to responsible gaming. And we're going to get there. But I feel like the more research I do about what you are doing, what your company is doing, that there's a lot of overlap between what you're doing for responsible gaming and what the company stands for, the, the company values. Um, so with that being said, before we dive into your responsible gaming initiatives, you know, when looking at Pavilion, it, it feels like everything you're doing is values driven. It's thoughtful. And I know one of your favorite quotes is, Skate to where the puck is going, not where it is. Well, and, and to be perfectly honest, right, that's stolen from Wayne Gretzky. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we are we are definitely very very value driven. Uh, we we really started off our uh, our journey as we broke away from global payments, uh, really looking at it from a uh, from a. I would think a really values driven point of view first and foremost was really a focus on our associates and making sure that we hired, trained and recruited the best people that we could get. But then we put programs in that mattered and that allowed us to win uh, certification for great places to work uh, right out of the gate with the scores that were 30 points ahead of other companies that typically uh, are, are just getting certified that first year because we believe that if we take care of our employees and we really put great associates uh, in the field and, and really behind all of the things that we do, they're going to take far better care of our customers. And that's that's one of those areas where if we're taking great care of our customers, which is uh, we look at our customers in two ways. One is the casino operator and the other is the patron because we, while the, while the casino operator are the ones that typically buy our services, we realize that we have to deliver incredible value to the consumer every day because it's them that are actually using the services and, and helping to drive momentum. So we spend a lot of time thinking through uh, delivering a frictionless customer journey, making sure that we're reducing a lot of the steps that it takes to enroll, to play, providing uh, certainty and confidence to everybody along the way. Um, and so we, kind of the thought process is we take care of our people, our people take care of our customers, our customers ultimately take care of us. And so it generates a really powerful flywheel uh, to deliver value back to our shareholders. And so we're very excited about the journey that we've been on and how we're how we're going about supporting an industry with a very powerful integrated payments ecosystem. Yeah, it's almost like you reverse engineer because you even talked before about managing or trying to do everything you can to make sure that the guest experience is good. Uh, if the guests are having fun, if they're enjoying their experience, it works backwards, then the operator is going to be happy. And it's happening because of some of the service and product that you're delivering. Well, you really hit the nail on the head because at the at its at its core, if if you individually will not use the services, then we're all wasting our time. So we do spend an inordinate amount of time having conversations with people like you. What do you like? How was your experience? Are there things that we could do to improve it? If there were some things that we would be that we could incorporate into an application or into your consumer journey that would make this a more powerful and rich experience for you, what would they be? And then we work very, very diligently to make sure that we incorporate those things, because if I can get you and your friends and all of the other consumer demographics that we look at, if we can get people utilizing the services in a safe and, and responsible way, then we, we feel like we've done our job. It's really trying, yeah. to, trying to follow an Amazon model that is, right, has 
incredible predictability. When you go online, you can find what you want, you can quickly pay for it, and you can look forward to your journey uh, ending with a happy delivery of whatever the product is. And we're trying to do a lot of the very same thing in a, in a very complex uh, gaming environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've mentioned in the past uh, to, to really make an effort to understand what people expect when they click that button. And uh, something stood out that you said uh, you invested a good year with Apple and Google teams to understand UI and UX. What came out of that? Well, it's an, it, it, it's, it's an interesting question. And a lot of things that came out of that um, were, com uh, were unexpected. Um, like, for, for example, simple terms, is, and this was in and around our, our mobile cashless solution uh, called VIP Mobility. Um, our Ernie journey uh, created button, just button labels, for example, that said deposit and withdrawal, right? My, our assumption would be you would deposit into the casino and you would withdraw back to your financial institution. Um, after we after we started our research, we found that the majority of consumers looked at it differently. They were going to deposit their winnings back to their financial institution. So what that created is uncertainty when people push the button. Um, it added friction because they would wind up going in a spot that that wasn't wasn't delivering on what they were hoping to achieve. So we were able to unwind and put button labels and it's i mean as simplistic as that sounds it makes a big difference because we're we're reducing friction mm -hmm. we also found that for example with uh customers there's a big button that says play when you would push the play button that would be how most people would think about play and that's that is exactly what the research found however about 37 percent of the consumers also thought that the way that they would put money on their favorite game was to touch the balance button. So what we did is we configured the balance button and the play button to deliver the same result so that no matter what you were, no matter how you think about play, we want to deliver the experience that you're expecting. And so it's a, it's a number of things like that that don't sound all that big on the surface, but when you're talking about reducing friction, uh, improving the customer journey, making things fast, efficient, uh, in a in a more pleasant experience for the guest, those are all little nuances that we felt were just really important to the launch of the product. And so, the, were there changes made to the wording of deposit and withdrawal? And if there were, what changed? Right. So, so now those are those are really uh, moving money money in and money out. Um, so we tried to make sure that we were looking. Uh, looking at the wording that was different than than how we were before, and so we tried a bunch of different iterations to come up with the ones that would yield uh, consumer research where where everybody was going to the right spot on the first button click, and then we also made sure that when you get to that, those points that there's not a lot of ex, um, extemporaneous information. There's all, but it, it's really simplifying the user experience down to uh, very few words, but very descriptive to really drive somebody, you know, down a path that they're expecting. Yeah, and it's always a challenge to, to distill a complex uh, behavior or even a complex thought mm -hmm. and make it simple. Uh, and, and it becomes kind of a test, I guess, trial and error to find out what works until you find that one kind of magical uh, solution. Yeah, we, we think it's a, a lot, a lot of this is around as well consistency, because if you think back to your grandparents used to have a Gimbel's card, uh, a Woolworth's card, Sears, et cetera, um, because each and every store felt that everything that they did was unique and it needed to be different than their competitors. But fast forward to today, none of those companies exist. None of those cards exist because 
the common consumer wants consistency, right? I might have a Nordstrom's visa, but it's a visa. It works the same wherever visa is accepted. And we believe that when we looked at, at VIP mobility, that we a consistent consumer journey across all properties was going to be critical to driving adoption. Because if my, if my process of use, utilizing a cashless solution is different at casino A than it is casino B and different than casino C, I'm not going to have the I'm not going to have the desire to learn all of those different processes and get into get into a consistent flow like I have when I use my money everywhere else on the planet. So we've really worked very, very hard to create that trust platform that delivers consistency and efficiency across all of our customers. Yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, the topic of cashless. Um, like you said, across the planet, uh, it comes down to cultural, maybe, because you look at Japan, they're still a very cash driven society culturally. And then you look at other places when I'm traveling through Asia, even when I go to buy something, a, a street vendor selling fruit, I can make a cashless payment with my phone, but there's almost another subculture. And those are the guests who come to the casino and what they're familiar with and how they're comfortable. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. And I think the that is part of what cashless can deliver to a casino environment is an improved feeling of safety and security. And there are a, a number of consumer examples that 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 we've gathered over over time for people that just feel safer. Um, they can enter the casino with no money in their pocket, with the touch of a button, they can deliver the money that they need to the casino, they can play to their heart's content, and they can then move their winnings back to, uh, back to one of their payment mechanisms and leave the casino with no money in their pocket. Uh, it delivers a better amount of uh, anonymous activity so that um, with my jackpot, I don't have somebody unstrapping hundreds and making a big show of getting my payout so that then I'm feeling even more vulnerable to the people who are now gathered around behind me to walk out of the casino. I can have slot operations come over and actually deliver that money electronically and nobody has to know. So I get that great euphoric feeling. I get a very fast payout. I get the excitement of everything that a jackpot means, but I don't get the negative consequences of feeling vulnerable because now I've got all the cash in my pocket. Yeah, I think what you're describing, too, is uh, there's a certain element of uh, empathy. Uh, you're trying to feel what the payout, the person receiving the payout, some of the fears that go through their head once they attract all that attention if they accept Absolutely. It in cash. Absolutely. It goes from a moment of joy to a moment of concern. And maybe that's maybe even right. fear. And, and when we're talking about gaming entertainment, right? The entertainment part should continue and we need to deliver solutions to the guest to allow them to eliminate those areas of concern because we've done the things necessary to re remove those obstacles. Mm. Uh, Chris, you've mentioned in the past that value drives adoption. Can you unpack that a little bit? How do you add value? Well, we add value by giving you the things that you want to help help drive your customer journey. I think it's about meeting you where you are and delivering the things that you want. And when I say you, I mean you as a consumer, and I mean that truly to the core. Um, and we, we have said this to a variety of our casino customers, and I don't know how the, well they appreciate it, but the intention is, right, at the moment, I really don't care what they think because the only one that matters is the consumer. Because as I said earlier, if you're not going to use it, we're all wasting our time. So we need to make sure that these things are powerful for you. And so, the idea that 
uh, there are things that the casino wants. And I get that those things are incredibly important, but I think those things come after delivering value to you as the player. So what do you want as a player? You want certainty, efficiency, control, and convenience when it comes to gameplay. So I want to be able to push a button. I want to be able to move money to my game. I want to have certainty that all that I know where my money is, that my game is funded correctly, that everything is working the way it should, right? That is kind of a core core opportunity. The um, other things in terms of like how your points are calculated, you've already got a system in place that's doing those kinds of activities in a way that you're comfortable with. Um, but are there other are there other uh, things that I would say more boil the ocean because they are there's a lot of ways to deliver value to a consumer. But we've also got to do that in a way that doesn't create so much change that then you just get lost in the complexity of it. It's almost like when Microsoft Windows or Microsoft Office changed all of the menus inside of the platform. So now the things that you once knew where they were, now you don't. It gets to be confusing and you've got that long adoption curve when in the casino space, right? I'm here for entertainment. I want to play now. Uh, I don't want to go through and figure out a system or go through some long enrollment process. I want to play now, right? I'm able to play now in the old way. I want to play now in the new way. And I want that to be fast and efficient. Yeah. So when you meet with an operator, is there sometimes a little bit of a friction, meaning you're saying you must, we must, drive changes cashless from the guest experience but then the operator has what they perceive as a priority in the way it should be is there sometimes a little bit of friction there about saying we need to adjust to the operator to adopt to what the guest wants it well there's there certainly can be i think you know we try to bring a lot of consumer research to the table as well that does point to what people want, what their spending patterns are. And we believe there's a way that we can help the operator skate to where the puck is going. Because if we are skating in alignment with the consumer trends, we will be in lockstep with the consumer and delivering value to the guest. And so we try to bring that bring that to the table. So it's not that the it's not that the other things aren't important. It's just we believe that there is a priority, a priority uh, in a sequencing that could be more proper. And that, that if I add a couple of things to an app, then the, the guest will learn those couple of things and they will continue to grow and build. Uh, let me just maybe like give you a better, a different example in the real world. We all want an Amazon.com experience in the casino space. Right. I want I want you to be able to go to my app, book a hotel. I want you to book a, book your restaurant reservations, look at your points, play all of those things. But what we forget is Amazon spent 30 years and billions of dollars to deliver that the experience that they have today. And if we were to come out with a casino experience that is the Big Bang Theory of all things to all people, one, we're unlikely to get there with the budgets that people have to spend. Second, it's going to be an incredibly clunky experience because it's really difficult to build all of those things at once. And then third, I think there's going to be such overwhelming change management for the typical consumer. They're just not going to adopt it. So we've got to get them in with the, the, the most important things to the consumer. Once we get them in and build build value and, and build utilization, we can start layering on those additional capabilities that drive meaning, you know, meaningful PL value to the casino as well. Which, by the way, cashless right out of the gate without any of those things delivers meaningful value and return on investment for the casino operator. Yeah, when you put it that way about Amazon, it's been a 30 years of uh evolution for them 
a cashless is kind of an infancy related when you compare it to 30 years of Amazon. Still learning, still ironing out some kinks, still improving. Oh, well, exactly. And that's that's also part of the reason to to start first with the most important aspects that it, that the guest is looking to deliver because that minimizes minimizes the number of activities that have to be tweaked in order to deliver an incredible experience. Yeah, you talk about the incredible experience. And I think this is where we can segue to Pavilion's commitment to responsible gaming. And recently, you committed to supporting Dr. Wohl's research about preemptive limit setting tools. Can you share a little more detail uh, about what's behind that, why you're committed to uh, this research in particular, and why you feel it's good for the industry? Certainly. Well, it's uh, this research is just the the latest step that we've made. We've done a variety of research in this area because we feel that it's uh, it's it's kind of the core responsibility of everybody within the uh, within the the industry's ecosystem. Pavilion just wants to lead the way in our areas because we believe it's really crucial to understand what makes what excuse me. We feel it's really crucial to understand what really makes people tick instead of assuming everybody's the same. So by digging deep into the reasons behind behaviors, we're working to create tools and systems that can help players set and maintain personal guardrails to promote responsible gaming. Um, the doctor's research is looking into whether spending limits established prior to gambling uh, are better at attacking, uh, attacking the problem gambling uh, triggers uh, than introducing something that is occurring after play begins. And the reason we're going down the path with the research in its present form is we spent, we spent time talking to the researchers. We spent time uh, really trying to understand people who live this every day. What are the, what are the areas of research that we should start with? And so this was the one that we chose. And we, we feel that our involvement is all about finding better ways for the gaming industry to be able to use responsible gambling tools. Yeah, you also have a feature, it's called a cooling off period, and you have a voluntary self-exclusion. How do those work? Well, so self, so really, what self, so self exclusion, and and this is, I think, there's just a bundle of solutions here. Self self exclusion has been around for a while, um, and that's where I say I have a problem, and if and if that's the case, right, we're going to believe the guest, and we're going to help them move down a path of stop stopping. Uh, or, or limiting their ability. And, and at least from our perspective, the things that we can do are cut off access to their financial accounts so they can't fund. It's going to create a barrier that allows that guest to impose, I don't want to play anymore. Don't allow me to fund. And they can do that. Likewise, we also enable uh, customized personal limits. That's an area whereby just because your bank uh, or your credit card gives you some outrageous limit because you're a high wealth individual, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the amount that you want to play. So we will we allow customers to reduce that limit to something that they feel is more appropriate. And once they set those limits, those limits are in place until they go through a process to uh, you know, to uh, change that. Likewise, the um, um, you know, there's also an opportunity whereby uh, whether a whether a regulator or an operator sees certain challenges with certain individuals for them to be ex for them to be excluded as well. So we have all of those capabilities that have been built into the built into the system. When it comes to other things like cooling off periods, there's a variety of research that uh, you know we've done with like the UNLV. Uh, collaborative on cashless's impact on responsible gaming, where we're we're continuing to gather information to find out 
what else should we be doing to allow and give the player the ability to establish proper guidelines or guardrails to uh, promote responsible play? Yeah, Castro has been on the podcast from UNLV, and it seems like payment providers within their data really is the answer to uh, how successful a lot of responsible gaming programs can be, and it really probably holds the key to the future of success for responsible gaming. I couldn't agree more. Payments data, uh, where payments and data really play a crucial role in promoting responsible gaming. And technology, more than anything, really allows a more effective way to track and analyze behavior over time. So by leveraging data and data analytics, we can detect potential signs of problem gambling. Uh, we can monitor and be able to provide detailed insights back to the player. Uh, to, you know, to help them go ahead and maybe make better decisions, but it also allows us to really pinpoint and detect patterns that we couldn't before in today's really paper-based environment. So, um, but one thing we that we're finding that I think is is maybe left out of the conversation is it's really important to note that we need to have a full view of the consumer's behavior, otherwise we could get, we can certainly make some false impressions because if we're only looking, for example, at a small fraction of what's going on where a consumer is making small deposits, but making big withdrawals, the immediate impression would be, ah, well, this, this player's a winner. Um, but yet without the other half, whereby uh, other funding methods could be used, other things that we don't see or don't track electronically, there could be a completely different view. It's almost the, the iceberg analogy. What you see is only, what, 20% of the entirety of the picture. And if we're making our decisions based on the 20%, we're going to be wrong. And so we believe that, the, that employing the technology does help us to develop the tools and help us to develop better understanding that over time we will figure out how can we do a better job of I don't know if intervening is the right word, but at least making people aware of what we're seeing um, and then allowing them to make their own decisions. From there, does that go, you know, what happens with what happens with that data and what other steps should we take? I don't think we're far in a lot far enough along in our journey. And I'm saying our collective journey as an industry, to really understand what what do we do with the data once we once we have something that's better than what we've had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, th I think throughout this conversation, it's clear uh, from the pavilion payments that uh, it's about the guest experience and that responsible gaming is a big part of the guest experience, uh, and that answers why you're committed to this. But I think there's more to it. I'm assuming. Um, is there more to the why? Why is everywhere I look, I feel like there's an, a new news about Pavilion being committed to responsible gaming. Is there more to it? Well, I think it's 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 just we feel it's incumbent on the entirety of the industry to create a safe environment for all participants and we need to do the best job that we can. And we're, we're trying to put our best fo foot forward in figuring that out. Um, I mean, to use it, to, I think to use an analogy with like the wine and spirits industry, um, they do a lot in terms of self-regulating their advertising. They put programs out there to, uh, you know, promote, uh, you know, or, or to, to at least, Right. We're not going to drive drunk, uh, you know, buzzed driving is drunk driving. The the industry does a lot to promote those kinds of activities. And yet they've got a similar challenge to the gaming industry, whereby uh, Anheuser-Busch and the rest of the manufacturers have no idea really who we are as individuals. And in today's cash based environment, it's pretty much the same. We can there's certain ways we can detect certain activities 
<clears throat> but we can't detect we can't detect everything. So we're doing the best we can uh, with what we have. And our approach is trying to figure out how can we leverage technology to just take that to another level to do a better job uh, and to be able to help uh, really create a much more a much more safe and healthy environment for everybody. You know, in business, we talked about how you reverse engineer. You start with the guest and then work kind of backwards. And you talk about uh, even in your organization uh, mm -hmm. where you're values driven. Um, if you were to work backwards with responsible gaming, uh, is there something that you're seeing uh, on the when you kind of analyze everything and you hear a lot of buzz and chatter about responsible gaming? Is there something we're missing? Is, do you feel like there's something even in your gut that you think, if we did this, it could be even better? That's a, well, that's a good question. I think the I think the industry has done the best that it can with what it has. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, it, it, this is a paper-based industry. In fact, one of the last paper-based industries in the world everything has gone electronic. In fact, when you go through and look at the, the amount of money spent during the holiday season, 60% of the holiday of, of spending was done on a mobile device just this past year. Trillions of dollars, hundreds of millions of mobile users. It's the way of the world. We, we're, we've, we all use that everywhere else in our lives with the exception of the casino space. But yet, you've got to deal with, right? We have to start with where, where we are, use what we've got, do the best we can. So cash-based environment, the primarily the way most responsible gaming things work today is painting everybody with the same broad brush of friction. And let me, you know, let me just use an example. And this, this, this example has changed, but even in Nevada, uh, up until I think to call it two years ago, um, you couldn't, you couldn't deposit more than $1,000 a day from a debit account into your wagering account, which, you know, if you're a high wealth individual, somebody that's playing, I mean, some of these folks play more than $1,000 in a hand of cards. So we're not limiting anything for those people flying in on their private plane, but yet that same $1,000 a day limit is going to bankrupt your typical fast food worker. So, that broad brush of friction, I think, makes us feel good, but I don't think it necessarily delivers the intentions of what we're trying to accomplish. And the only way we can accomplish what we want is to take a look at the individual and at the individual's needs. And so that's where we're trying to make sure that the research that we're doing and the tools that we put in place are more targeted to the individual so that they can establish their own frameworks, they can manage their own play, and hopefully be more responsible. Great. You know, Chris, as we kind of come to the tail end here, um, what are some things as we kind of push forward in responsible uh, gaming? And what are some things you've seen in the last, say, couple years that you feel really good about? Uh, that, that we're making progress, that strides are being made? Well, I think that the things I feel really good about are the steps that we've taken from a technology perspective to do a better job of tracking. I think we're doing a better job of promoting uh, responsible gaming uh, across all channels. Um, I think when you look at, um, frankly, frankly, I think sports betting even helps that because on the uh, whether it's the AGAs have a game plan program that's been adopted by uh, a lot of the professional uh, uh, leagues, uh, the sports betting advertising, they're all talking about responsible gaming. <clears throat> I mean, of course, yes, come in and participate, but come in and participate responsibly, have a plan, have a budget, uh, you know, establish, establish a way to play within your means. I think all of that is fantastic. And so I even look at as sports betting expands across the US. Um, I think that's really good for America. And, and, our, and the reason for that is the people that are currently gambling in those states are gambling in a black market 
in an, an environment where nobody is promoting responsible gaming. Uh, none of the tools are none of the tools are being deployed to create a safe environment. And I think our industry is doing an amazing job of helping to propagate that as the industry grows across the country. Mm. Um, final thing here, uh, really two things. Uh, for vendors listening to this interview right now, and they're curious, they, they see what you're doing, what Pavilion's doing for responsible gaming, they want to get involved. Uh, one, uh, how would you recommend, what would you tell them to get involved or take the first step? And two, what are some good things that you're seeing from your commitment to responsible gaming? Maybe even within your company, maybe it's a source of pride for your associates. Uh, can you kind of unwrap that a bit? Certainly. Um, so I think there's a number of, there's certainly a number of ways for folks to get in, to get involved. Um, the ICGRA, uh, you know, is certainly a, a great group to help drive uh, research. UNLV is doing a lot of research in this area. Um, I think it's an area where engaging the engaging the American Gaming Association, right, to start having uh, more open dialogue about people and what they want to contribute and how they want to uh, join the Have a Game Plan program. I think all of that stuff is uh, super important. Frankly, if somebody wants to get started, I mean, I'm happy to I'm happy to share in, insights and you know take that conversation offline. So uh, lots of good stuff there. Um, and then I think to the other part of your question, um, it's just one of the things that we're we're dedicating to supporting. Um, I think addiction in all forms, alcohol, drugs, gambling, you know, et cetera. Uh, there's almost nobody that's unaffected by some form of addiction. And you know, while while we don't have a way to necessarily help with help with everything, the one thing that we do as a business is is uh, an ability to help contribute to uh, an addiction that that we've got the ability to help solve. And I am very proud and of the work that the that the pavilion team has done in this regard. And I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's just a, uh, a thing that we can all hold, you know, hold our head high and be very proud and, and enthusiastic about the work that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, very good, uh, Chris, thank you. Thank you for your time today. Uh, absolutely, I really appreciate you having me on. It's great to talk to you this morning. Thank you.